It is a great honor to welcome Professor Lee Congdon on this podcast. He is the Professor Emeritus of History at James Madison University. He recently published a book called George Kennan for Our Time. And this uh, conversation should focus on the subject of that particular book, George Kennan. How are you today, Lee? Thank you for joining the show. I find it nice to be with you. Great. So first, I'd like to ask, um, what makes a good historian? What makes a good historian? I think you have to um, have a great interest in the past uh, without uh, thinking that you have to uh, have lessons for the present necessarily. That's an added benefit. But I think to be a real historian, you have to have to be a very interested in in, uh, 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 in in the past, just for its own sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, the follow up question would be: Why should we be interested in the past? Well, part, partly because it's interesting in and itself, and that it, it tells us something about who we are and um, where we came from, and and who we are. Uh, that doesn't mean that isn't you know that it's not giving us. In fact, Kennan thought that its main main advantage was that it could give us ideas about the how we ought to proceed in the future. Um, in that sense, he really wasn't a historian. He was interested in the present day. Uh, I think real historians though are interested in the past for its own sake, um, who we are, where we came from. Uh, and uh, that there's no uh, looking at it as if there's you know some kind of great benefits going to come out for the for the future. It's just a love of the past and and uh, who we are and where we came from. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I'm told because uh, based on our previous exchanges that you are you have a personal friendship with George Cannon himself. So tell me about him as a person. Uh, yes, I wouldn't call it a friendship. Uh, in, I, I did meet him once uh, in the early 80s. I spent a year at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he was a permanent member, and I was a visiting member. And um, John Elliott, who was a great historian of early modern Spain, uh, was a member there. And he knew that I was um, interested in, in and admired uh, Kennan. And he said, well, um, you should just go up to him at, at lunch, you know, and, and say you'd like to talk to him. I said, I don't, I don't think I really can do that. And he said, everybody says that, so he eats lunch by himself. And um, so uh, John uh, arranged a, um, a dinner for my wife and myself and the Kennans. And um, so we had this dinner. And a lot of it, uh, I, I can't remember. I do remember certain things, um, his great dignity, um, and uh, I guess above all, his total lack of condescension toward us because we weren't, at the same time, he didn't pretend he wasn't George Kennan. So he, he knew how to handle fame. I think that was the thing that impressed me the most. We did have one um, friend in common, and I remember that conversation. John Lukács, the um, uh, Hungarian-born American historian, was a very close friend of, of Kennan's and also was a close friend of mine. So we had that in common. Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course, uh, I'd like to dive into Kenneth's Hungarian connection, so to speak, but uh, let's start by mentioning that, well, George Kennan lived a very long life, didn't he? He was born in 1901, and he passed away in 2005, which, um, is, which makes him one of the few uh, American diplomats who Across the centenary mark, um, George Schultz is, was one of them, and yeah, with luck, Kissinger maybe one this year. Um, and during that time, Cannon obviously witnessed the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the end obviously of the Cold War, actually the entirety of the Cold War, and the war in Iraq. So, of um, based on his very long life. Um, what does George Kennan, I guess, at the end or throughout his uh, entire career as a foreign serviceman view, uh, I guess, war and peace? 
how, how does he view war and peace? Kennan was basically uh, anti-war, although not as a kind of ideology where he was going to oppose every war. He, he thought there can be times when uh, it's necessary to take up arms, but he thought that those were rare occasions and you ought to be absolutely clear what you're go fighting for, what the end of your battle might be, how you're going to get out of it and end it. Um, he thought the, um, the First World War was the great catastrophe of European civilization from which it had never recovered. Uh, the Second World War, uh, he was, we re he really he realized there was, once Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was nothing to be done about it. But he had very different views of how the war should have been conducted. He, he, he didn't have a very high regard for President Roosevelt and Roosevelt's conduct of the war, primarily because uh, of the unconditional surrender position that uh, Roosevelt uh, took in 1943. Yes, um, I think I would like to focus um, this uh, conversation on two subjects that Kennan knew thoroughly about. One is um, the, I guess, the conduct of the Soviet Union and of communism in general, as well as the US response to communism, its fight against communism, and I guess uh, certain perceived shortcomings that Kennan noticed. But I was I was very surprised uh, that when I read your book that Kennan, uh, one of his father is named after um, Kossuth, the, the Hungarian national hero. And That's so, right. so uh, does that mean that I think that means that um, Kennan is a uh, part Hungarian. And so given that, how did he view the events of uh, 1956? Well, the events of 1956, I think he thought that, um, in fact, I know he thought that um, Imre Noyge, who was the great leader of, of the revolution, uh, should not have withdrawn from the Warsaw Pact, that the, that the Soviets didn't care so much um, uh, what what he did internationally, what the Hungarians did internationally, but they did care what what how they were going to be governed uh, within the country and not break in any way with the Soviets. Um, he was misinformed on one thing. He thought, you know, that the uh, uh, that that Noyge mistake was withdrawing from the Warsaw Pact. But we know now that that the, the Soviets had already uh, uh, decided to re, uh, to intervene, and uh, they changed their mind overnight. Almost, they, they, he could not have known that, but they did decide to intervene before that. Um, his his knowledge of he didn't have a lot of knowledge about Hungary. He knew uh, a fair amount about uh, where he, is, he had been stationed in uh, the former Yugoslavia uh, and in uh, Czechoslovakia. So he knew. Um, and they were both Slavic countries, and his, his, he was, you know, as unbelievably talented linguistically. And um, he, one of the few languages he didn't know was Hungarian, actually. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, what do you find, uh, you know, what is a key biographical details of him, of his um, upbringing that you believe influenced his, um, his worldview, so to speak? Well, he he, um, he lost his mother uh, when he was like two months old or something, and that seemed to have a, a kind of perm leave a permanent mark on him. He, he seems to have had in his mind that somehow he was responsible for his mother's death, uh, and um, he grew up with a kind of stepmother, and he, so he, he always felt that this was a great loss in his life. Um, a lot of Kennan's work can be traced back to sort of his, his personal life, but I think that's true of everybody, really. Um, there's a new biography of, of Kennan out by Frank Hostiglia. Uh, it's, it's pretty good, and generally I'm sympathetic with the idea of, of uh, tying someone's personal life uh, to his ideas. I think um, ideas do not, uh, don't exhaust their own meaning. I think you, uh, you need to look at them within the context of the world in which the person lived and the person's personal life to, to understand 
really what the, that person is is saying. So, um, I, but I think Costa carries it too far. So we learn a lot about Kennan's uh, affairs and and um, uh, other unpleasant things that he, all of which he was he felt guilty about. Uh, I think that I, I don't think that it's all right to bring that up. I think because we need to know that, but. I think it's it's carried too far in this book. I see. Um, how, why is uh, I guess uh, how would you explain Kennan's I guess anti-war view? Because, like you said, the the phrase anti-war has become a, sort of an ideology, and it implies you know left-wing student protesters and not and not you know, dignified diplomats who serve in the U.S. government. Yeah, he, he was not anti-war in the sense that, you know, you can't ever, ever fight a war. He's very far from thinking that. Uh, as I said, I think he thought that you ought to be careful about when you enter into wars. Um, you know, he, he was um, basically an isolationist, uh, which was sort of the standard position of the United States until the, the uh, uh, Spanish-American War. When we got involved in in that, and then when Woodrow Wilson uh, ascended to the presidency, um, and we got us into the First World War, which Kennan thought was a terrible mistake. So do I, by the way. Um, after that, uh, all governments have been Wilsonian in the United States. They're all interventionists. They're all uh, interested in spreading democracy as they understand it around the world. And if it takes, you know, a force, then they're they're willing to. In fact, they're often will say that it's perfectly all right to use force to force on people. Um, Kennan thought that was a horrendous mistake. Um, that it wasn't our business to tell other people how they live live their lives. We have enough problems learning how to live our life. Yes, and to further, um, I guess, follow up on that, I think. Um, Obviously, today the word isolationism and isolationist has kind of become a term, a derogatory term to describe anybody who say has any misgivings about, uh, you know, our uh, the U.S.'s um, continued involvement in the Russo-Ukraine war. But there was, like you said, there was a time when the the idea of isolationism was reigned supreme, and I thought that I believe historically speaking. Um, when the early Republicans uh, were, I guess, the 20th century Republicans of, say, Coolidge and Hoover, I believe, was in power, isolationism was used as a uh, was a ex reason as such. Um, well, the USA is uh, too good, too uh, too moral, too virtuous a nation to enter into the muckiness of European affairs. Um, but when say, after Vietnam, and especially after Iraq. Um, isolationism is a race because, well, America is, is morally corrupt, and we cannot uh, spread our moral corruption and, you know, um, I guess, decadency through, throughout the world. So uh, what, what flavor of isolationism, I guess, uh, would Kennan uh, subscribe to? Well, for, for one thing, he, he, he wouldn't, uh, he certainly wasn't among those who thought that, you know, we're not good enough to spread spread around, although actually he did sort of think that. Um, uh, he was an isolationist sort of on, on principle. He thought it was uh, not our, our business or our competence to tell other countries and how they should conduct their affairs. Um, there are a lot of terrible governments in the world, as we all know. Um, his, his belief was, Basically, there's nothing America can do about the internal affairs of another country that you can't change those in, unless you're willing to invade the country and take it over yourself and rule yourself. So if you're not willing to do that, there's not much you can do about even the most terrible regimes. For example, the Soviet Union, he thought was one of the worst governments in, in history, which it was. Um, but he, he, he was not in favor of invading the Soviet Union, overthrowing Stalin and trying to establish a dictator, I mean, a, a democracy or something. He thought the only business of the United States was to how the government of a particular country, uh, what is its actions, how it affects the United States. Um, and that then it's our business. 
but it's not our business to tell people what kind of government they have to have, um, which is always the same thing, you know, some kind of American government. Um, he didn't think, A, he thought it was a mistake to try to do that. And second, that it's impossible to do that. Anyway, short, short of taking over a country. Um, so Kennan was one among the first of you know, US diplomats after World War II to, to recognize, to perceive the, I guess, the true character of the Soviet Union at the time when um, I think Harry Truman um, was uh, calling for a uh, long lasting cooperation with the Union, harkening back to the times as allies against Hitler. So that resulted in the infamous or famous long telegram, which uh, later was uh, a refined version of it was published in Foreign Affairs and it remains the most well-known article in that magazine, the source of Soviet conduct and which he signed X. So I guess uh, I'd like to ask first, uh, why the sign, why the X signature? The reason for the X signature is pretty simple. He was, he was then still uh, a member of the State Department and um, he was speaking in his own voice about this. And uh, so he, he, he wanted to make clear that he's not speaking for the, you know, as an official State Department official. Of course, it was, he was outed almost immediately. So it was, it was known that, um, that he, had, he had done that. So, uh, and that you're right, it, it then became famous. His attitude though, toward, <laughs> toward communism was this, he was always anti-communist during the, the, the um, uh, early, uh, lead, during the early years of the Soviet Union, he was thought to be very hardline, too hardline communist. Um, after the war, when uh, he was, uh, during, the, after the war was the Second World War, he um, came to be thought of as some kind of dove, as sort of, you know, as some soft on com communism, that, which was not true. I mean, it, it depended on what the situation was at the time for him. Um, Communism was a horrible regime, but there wasn't much we could do about it. He was sorry that because he was a great lover of the Russian people. So he's very sorry about the regime, which he despised from the beginning. But he also thought that after the war that um, we should conduct a sort of reasonable, you know, correct response uh, uh, relations with the Soviets, but uh, we shouldn't be overly friendly with them. He never thought that he always thought the, the wartime alliance with the Soviets was purely a matter of convenience. And when the war is over, that's it. I mean, uh, to pretend that we're all gonna get along with Uncle Joe, which a lot of them, including President uh, Truman thought, and he wasn't the only one, um, that this was, to him was, was a big mistake. You don't, they didn't understand the nature of the, of, of the Soviet regime. Mm -hmm. I think, um, especially nowadays, um, the reluctance to for any, I guess, um, I guess uh, experts on foreign policy to uh, to call themselves isolationists. Uh, well, first because they want to be taken seriously, but secondly, um, I think many of the so-called isolationists, um, I guess, um, they of course they oppose certain U.S. military interventions. But at the same time, they've mm, they harbor certain illusions about the regime in which uh, you know the U.S. is happened to be opposing at that time. Say, I'm thinking about George Galloway and Saddam Hussein. That that'd be the case. So the isolationists, at least uh, in the minds of say liberal interventionists and neoconservatives, is often thought of as you know Westerners who are who are way too naive about the degree of evil and tyranny that, say, uh, a dictator has happened to have, say, a Joseph Stalin or a Saddam Hussein. But Kennan, despite his isolationism, held zero illusions about the, I guess, the moral evil of the Soviet Union. So, right. so in, I guess, in the uh, Foreign Affairs article, The Source of Soviet Conduct, uh, what did Kennan notice about the Soviet Union and Soviet communism that his peers, um, in the foreign service uh, did not. Part of it is, of course, that he'd served in, in, in Soviet Russia for, for many years. 
So he had a, a really uh, up close and personal um, view of the regime. So he had no, no illusion. He never had any illusions about Marxism, which he thought was a stupid and uh, ridiculous philosophy. Um, he had, had no illusion about the, about the regime. Um, and so, but many of the others in the State Department uh, did have illusions about it. Some, some of them were actually just some, somewhat similar, uh, sympathetic with, with the communist regimes. But a lot of them were just thought, uh, were just naive about the thought, well, it's just sort of the same thing as ours. We're just, um, we're pretty, pretty much the same page. We're just, we'll get come closer to closer as time goes by. Kind of never thought that. He thought that the, the Soviet regime would collapse uh, under its own weight eventually. And he was right about that. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned that Kennan was a realist. And again, realism is a, I guess, a foreign policy doctrine uh, or school that has re recently at least gone out of favor. Um, I know that Mearsheimer is still like making headlines and such, but overall liberal internationalism is now the dominant school. But right. you know, some of the most remarkable, um, I guess, um, diplomats and uh, foreign policy experts, uh, um, naming Cannon as well as Kissinger, and of course Morgenthau, were realists. And the the favorite, the realist's favorite phrase to invoke is the national interest or the French uh, raison d'état. So um, uh, I, I certainly believe that um, for to like to um, in order for the U.S. to carry on a a successful, at least a balanced foreign policy, it has to keep that phrase, the national interest in mind. The next uh, the next question is, how should we conceptualize the American national interest? So how would Cannon tackle that question? I think he thought the, that by the national interest, he meant that in a fairly narrow way. So that, uh, so remember President Bush the second said, you know, our, and I think Obama, the same thing. This has got to be a standard line that, you know, our, our national interest and the moral improvement are, are, are the same thing. Kennan didn't think that for a second. He thought the national interest um, was very narrowly conceived. What, you know, what, uh, what effect are policies of another government going to have directly on the United States? We have an interest in that. Um, what kind of government they have, he didn't think was in our business. He believed in the balance of power and that you could never get a serious people can never get away from the, from the balance of power. And that means that you can't think in terms of just dominating the world or your number, your number one, that there are other powers. Um, they may be down for a while, like Russia was, China was, but not forever. And, um, that you have that there's something reasonable about balance of power. That you try try to uh, realize there are other people have other interests. They may sometimes conflict, and that's then we have to try to you know do what we can to uh, minimize the danger of those of those conflicts. But you can't pretend that uh, people are all going to come to the same so-called liberal democracy idea as the only kind of government that is that is legitimate. Kind of never thought that for a minute. Uh, no realist thinks this. Um, Edmund Burke didn't think this. Uh, Tocqueville didn't think, I mean, the people who, who are the superior, to, to my judgment, the superior minds in foreign policy never thought that. Um, we all have our, you know, the idea that we all have the same moral ideas is also false. Uh, that doesn't mean the ones we have are, are not valid, but it does mean that other people have different moral views and um, you can't pretend that they don't um, or that they're completely illegitimate because they're not exactly the same as ours. Okay. I think um, most realists, especially the most um, well-known ones, would oppose or at least be reluctant to the notion that, um, I guess, the conduct of foreign policy should have a an element of um, morality in it, either personal or national. So naturally it will lead to it will lead to say Kennan as well as Kissinger and other uh, realists um, saying that well certain regime that uh, whose conduct, whose uh, governance is objectionable to us, to the US, um, it's not beyond cooperation because 
and in some areas we can share mutual interests and of course that leads to Kissinger's his, uh, famous infamous uh, Dayton policy and I'm sure Cannon would um, you know co-sign that um, I think con in contemporary times the China has taken over the Soviet Union as the U.S.'s number one geopolitical enemy rival. So what set of policies would Kennan, had he still had he still been alive today, would advocate um, in regards to in regards to the U.S.'s uh, treatment of the People's Republic? I think he would uh, his, his attitude toward that would be he was not an expert on on Asian as he admitted. Mm -hmm. um, his, he was a you know Russianist and a Europeanist. Um, I think his attitude would be that uh, we ought to maintain correct relations with them. It's always to him it was always a good idea to maintain some kind of co uh, diplomatic contact, communication, keep communi communication uh, open. Um, other than that, he's, I would he would have thought he would, that doesn't mean we have to be chummy or you know close friends or anything like that. Um, but he, he would, uh, I think he would have thought that while the, um, the Chinese represent certainly an, an economic challenge, and I think he would have said that, um, who says that we can't have, only America can have economic dominance. I mean, other people have economic interests too. I think he would have thought that the, the, the military threat of the Chinese, I'm speaking now for him, what I think he would have said, uh, that the military threat of the Chinese was toward the United States was exaggerated. Mm -hmm. So in his uh, famous um, essay, The Source of Soviet Conduct, um, Cannon posits that, you know, I guess, um, Stalinism is in some ways a continuation of Russian history, both in its, uh, in, I guess, nationalism and its expansionism. At this time, there's just the ideology of Marxism added into it. I believe um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who is an expert on Soviet communism, although in a vastly different perspective, would say that, well, communism and Marxism is actually the corrupting influence of the, you know, either the Russian Marx, uh, Russian nationalism and, say, the Russian Christianity, the Orthodox Church. So I guess uh, why would Kennan believe that, you know, Soviet communism is actually a historical continuation rather than a, I guess, deviation. Yes, you're right about what Solzhenitsyn said. And from my own point of view, I think Solzhenitsyn was, was right about this. Um, Kennan was a little um, back and forth on this a little. Um, he did think that there were some continuities from the, the czarist regime into the communist period, but he did think Marxism did play a a serious ro role in, in accentuating this sort of alienation from the West and, and hostility. Um, in, in this case, I think Solzhenitsyn was closer to the truth. I th and, and I think you can see this one. The minute that communism ended in, in the Soviet Union, um, Russia became something like what it was in the past. They're still struggling, of course, because they're under pressure to become democratic, whatever that means. And for Americans, that means American government, that's all. Um, but, the, but the government of, of, of Russia is, uh, President Putin's government is more in the tradition of, of the of, of Russian history of, of kind of authoritarian rule that's, that, is, that is not totalitarian. Um, it's authoritarian, but it's not ideological. And it's not tyrannical. It is. Uh, it, is it is sort of authoritarian. And uh, Kennan himself actually pervert, uh, preferred regimes that were authoritarian. He knew that that wasn't going to happen in in America, uh, and so he had hopes that um, some kind of representative government could be reestablished. I, I think it's probably not going to happen. The the democratic ideology is so strong. Egalitarian ideology is so strong in the United States and the West that it's not, it's never challenged. I mean, people just think you're crazy if you're not an egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to the hypothesis of uh, if, if George Kennan was still alive today, say, say he published another essay in Foreign Affairs titled 
the source of uh, Putin's conduct, what sort of uh, theses would he advance? I think he'd be basically sympathetic with Putin. He was he was one in his early years. I mean, he's lived to see Putin come to mm -hmm. power. I think he was, uh, as, as Solzhenitsyn was, uh, not not that they were totally uncritical, of course, um, but they're sort of sympathetic with this. They see in Putin, um, in in the uh, Russian tradition, he um, he's, he gets elected in democratic government, you know, democratic elections. But it's true that he exercised power. Um, that goes beyond uh, what is his by law, that there is an authoritarian streak in him. But for Kennan, that's a good thing. I mean, he thought uh, he had, you know, he had absolutely no sympathy with any kind of democratic government. Um, to him, authoritarian governments, as I said, kind of non-tyrannical, non-ideological, um, was probably the best you're going to get. Uh, he was sympathetic with, you know, Schuschnigg's government in Austria. Um, and Salazar's government in, in Portugal. Um, this was something, of course, most all, all Americans know is they're all fascists and, and, and Nazis or something like that, which means they don't really think what they're talking about. Um, so he was sympathetic with authoritarian government. He, he knew though that in, in the late thirties, he thought, um, because there was a lot going on, remember in the thirties where they, um, uh, there was a lot of talk about, you know, even the Roosevelt government sympathetic in certain ways with Mussolini's, Mussolini's government. So um, he did think that there might be some kind of turn to authoritarianism in the late 30s. But by the end of the, the Second World War, he knew this was not, not going to happen. He, what he hoped for then was some kind of representative government that was the founding fathers uh, put in place, or thought they did, um, in which representatives would be elected by, he hoped by some kind of limited franchise. And then the representatives would make decisions, but they wouldn't just pull the population. I mean, if you want to know, you're trying to find the truth, you don't pop, you know, you don't pull the population. I think um, if I were to make a guess, um, Kennan would be very skeptical of um, the current U.S. foreign U.S. policy towards um, the Russo-Ukraine war, you know, the continual aid of uh, Zelensky and the war effort. And he would, I believe, point to the historical, I guess, fact that for the longest time, um, Russia uh, still believes that Ukraine is part of its territory. Um, yeah, uh, it was during the Soviet Union and it had been during the centuries before that. Um, Ukraine has only been a, an independent nation, like truly independent nation since, I guess, the fall of the Soviet Union. And so it's with that historical example in mind that, you know, it, uh, I guess, uh, Russia's uh, conquest, so to speak, of Ukraine can be explained. But uh, people who are sympathetic of the U Ukrainian effort would would point to the massive famine um, that um, that Stalin unleashed onto the Ukrainian population, the Holodomor, and believes that uh, even though uh, Russia sees Ukraine as part of it, as territory, it has never treated the Ukrainian population with a sense of decency. So uh, I guess, uh, what where would Kennan um, side on that? Well, I mean, we have to remember that, you know, this is, you're, you're right about uh, the terrible, you know, the math, I mean, basically the starvation of Ukrainians. That was carried out by Stalin, who, who was, of course, not a, not a Russian, but he was Russified. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it was terrible. Um, so the, the uh, and people in that part of the world have long memories. And uh, so that they don't forget things like that. So that, you know, that's, that's fair enough. Um, the, the, it's also true that you know most of the pogroms in um, in, in Russia so before the Soviet regime, the Soviet Revolution, um, where almost all of them were were in uh, the lands of the of Ukraine. Part of that was the Pale set Settlement, so it's not all. I mean, it, that's where they put the Jews, so it's not all the Ukrainians' fault. Nevertheless, that's that's where most of the almost all of the major pogroms were, uh, and the Ukrainians certainly were involved in that. Um, 
So, I mean, no one's, no group of people are, you know, perfect. I'm not saying that Ukraine, Ukrainians are uniquely evil, but uh, I, I don't think it. Um, they have every read, and they have, you know, I can understand their point of view. I, th I think that, uh, I think it was regrettable that, that um, uh, Putin had decided to in, invade Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, I think the, 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 res the real responsibility here is on the United States, or NATO, but th that is the United States, um, in pushing um, NATO closer and closer to Russia's borders. That was promised um, by uh, Bush's um, secretary, I forgot the guy's name already, because they're all the uh, secretary. Jim Baker, right? Is it Jim Baker, Baker, yeah. They're all, they're all forgettable except for Kissinger. So, um, <laughs> um, so Baker said that that you know not we would we would go um if if they allowed uh Germany to come together and join NATO, uh they wouldn't go one inch further toward the east. But they did. And um uh, and it's now they're up against uh, and now they get, they get further and further and the Russians didn't do anything. But now they get to Ukraine, it was right on the border. And you know really at that point um, and they're still talking about, you know, being part of NATO. And they say, well, it's not against the Russian. Well, who, who is it against then? Um, so, so Putin uh, really, uh, no, no Hungarian, I mean, Hungarian, no Russian regime of any color could, could just uh, accept that they're going to, that NATO is going to be at, at their door. Um, so I think the, however, uh, I regret the, the invasion. I don't much care for wars. Um, at the same time, uh, I hold a re the United States responsible for this. Um, well, I guess um, we've gone quite a long time talking about George Kennan, obviously without mentioning that word, which he is uh, forever associated with containment. <laughs> and um, I think uh, throughout his life, um, after he wrote the famous that famous essay in which he suggested a policy of containment regarding communism, the ideology, he has constantly ex expressed like regret and misgivings over the fact that 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 uh, framework that doctrine has been taken the wrong way. So, um, how would you compare and contrast um, Kenneth's original version of containment versus what has been applied in the name of containment? Sure, he. For him, containment meant uh, political containment, not military. So that he thought that if you uh, f have a firm uh, political uh, f firm firmness, uh, that this that that the regime would collapse, you know, un under its own weight. He did not have in mind, you know, constant military confrontations um, and so on. But people took it to be military confrontations. So the, so so we get all these. Uh, wars and you know all, all over the place you know when, when there were anti-communist wars Vietnam of course was the most famous or infamous one um, uh, so people th thought he meant that we have to we've got to militarily confront the, uh, the uh, any communist regime that's not what he had in mind he thought he thought that uh, political uh, firmness and and uh, uh, was what he had had in mind so um, he was horrified that, that people thought we should, you know, take up arms every time some some country was in danger of a communist takeover. Yes, um, um, you know, reading back in history, I'm again, I'm, I was just say that I myself am a Vietnamese person, um, North Vietnamese, so to speak. I was born in Hanoi. Um, there are surprising, there are surprisingly a lot of similarities between what happened in Korea versus what happened in my own country of Vietnam. Uh, those are the two test cases with massive similarities, but end up very differently. We still have two Koreas, but instead of two Vietnams, we have one. So I believe Kennan obviously saw what happened uh, all throughout. Um, so how would he compare and contrast, um, I guess, uh, American intervention, which uh, altered, which caused the, these uh, two outcomes and or what was American intervention different or similar to in both cases? No, they were they, they were different. Um, when the uh, North Korea attacked South Korea, um, Kennan thought that uh, that the American the U.S. could not just let that happen. Um, 
and do not do nothing. So he was in favor of of, of a kind of military reaction that, however, his idea was only up to the was it the 38th parallel, but not beyond that, because the minute you go beyond that, he thought what was going to happen is you're going to draw either the Chinese or the, or the Russians into it. And of course, that's, of course, I did go beyond it up to the Yalu River, River. And so naturally, the Chinese did intervene. So he, he was, uh, you know, that was not his idea. He thought up, up to up to the you know where the had been the line had been before and that's it as far as vietnam vietnam was concerned when the war start, started he was um so when the u.s started to get into it uh he was uh serving in yugoslavia as ambassador so he was sort of occupied with other things when he got back you know he looked at it but basically um he thought that um it was none of the United States business. He had no, he had nothing but contempt for the for the uh, communist nationalist communist regime in in the north. Um, he didn't think that it was our business to get involved in it. Um, he felt sorry for people who have to suffer. In the end, they all suffered anyway. So I mean, uh, uh, but he didn't think it was in in, in America's national interest. Uh, as opposed to, you know, that doesn't mean he didn't have sympathy for the Vietnamese people, he did. But uh, he didn't think it was any of America's fundamental interest to get involved in this. And uh, it's hard to see why he wasn't right. I mean, uh, so I've like 56,000 American guys died. Um, the, the country was torn apart, you know, over, over the, the war. Uh, all kinds of young people, uh, <laughs> I know from my students, you know, who, uh, Claim that they're, they're only interested in you know uh, the uh, Americans being to, you know uh, trying to defeat other people. Actually, most of them didn't want to be drafted. That was that was pretty much it. Um, and um, you know, again, it's it's like he, his attitude to it was always the same. He was sympathetic with people that are you should have sympathy for. Uh, he didn't think there was much we could do for it, unless you get yourself involved in, in a war like we did in Vietnam. And what what good did that do to America? Really, nothing. Actually, you know, it hurt the, the Vietnamese people. And also, it's true that the, the so-called anti-war people uh, at the time, I remember these people. Um, yeah, the minute the war, was, you know, when you just got out of the war. Uh, they didn't care about all the boat people coming over. All of a sudden, they lost complete interest in this, you know. So they, they really didn't care about the Vietnamese people. They they were just anti-Americans. That's all. I think uh, the keystone for, I guess, U.S. intervention in Vietnam was the domino theory, most notably proposed by Robert Strange McNamara. Um, I think I think if we I think if, uh, the way I look at it is it is a kind of a version of containment, isn't it? Like he, we need to uh, restrict the spread of communism from the North-South Vietnamese border so that it won't spread to the entirety of Southeast Asia. So in that sense, it does sound like containment to me. Um, so uh, what would Kenan, uh, what would Kenan's objections to it be? Well, his objection would be that that's a military containment that now we're talking about, not not a political one. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, he, he thought this was, um, uh, you know, he, he liked to quote, you know, a famous line from from John Quincy Adams, who said, you know, who was Secretary of State at the time, and he he said, you know, we're in favor of freedom and and um, with for pe peoples around the world, but we don't go in, in, in uh, search of monsters to destroy. And um, Kennan often qu quoted that. Um, we feel sorry for people who are persecuted and stuff. Uh, decent people do. But uh, the idea that we're going to police the world, and then how are we going to do this? I mean, short of taking things over. What happens then uh, if when America, look what's happened in, in the Near East where we mess around all over the place. And have we made it better for the people in the Near East? I don't think so. We've killed all kinds, hundreds of thousands of them. And um, and and they're, they're no no better off than, than we started this. It's really just none of our business. You know, I feel sorry for people who live with under crummy governments, but I feel sorry for a lot of people. Okay. Yes. Um... I should say that in uh, in my home country, um, almost every village um, 
has a a cenotaph which um which is served to commemorate the the people who were, who were sacrificed in the war um and so i think that serves as a reminder that you know war means untimely unnecessarily death and i believe that the i guess um if there is a failure in the american way of war so to speak it is that they have uh, overlooked the the aspect that people die in wars tragically unnecessarily those who are not are wounded and traumatized so to speak and i think canon of all people should know this having seen so many americans uh, american wars happen and americans uh, dying as a result and i i certainly believe that um yeah uh, looking i guess the american foreign policy way of war is that well it's its purpose is just if we gain a victory then you know further lives can be prevented from either dying or living under tyranny so i guess of course uh, the the question would be what would uh, how would canon object to that well i think he thought that you know you uh, people always think you know if we could just get rid of a particular regime you don't like uh, say, especially, uh, say, the czarist regime. So you don't like the czarist regime. It's not democratic. Um, and if you get rid of that, uh, people believe, you know, things are going to be a lot better. And as Kennan said in one time, he said, you know, um, have we not learned anything from this? I mean, um, so what we got uh, was something infinitely worse than the czarist regime. Um, and um, and these places in the Near East, you know, um, so we, they get in involved in Libya, and that's it's a nightmare now. You know, Iraq, it's, it's ter terrible. Um, Afghanistan, it just went to the Taliban anyway. Unless we could just be there forever, you know, we actually were long there for 21 years or something, and um, and uh, it went to the Taliban anyway. I mean, um, basically, it was none of our business. I, again, I feel sorry for Afghan people. I feel sorry for Iraqi people. Also, there's this idea that. People in in these countries that, that are not Americanized, that they um, they're all their one uh, open life is that we they become like Americans. I don't see why why people think this. I mean that uh, everyone wants to be American. I don't think that's true, mm -hmm. and I know Kennan didn't think it was true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have way too many other nationalities to go around. Um, I think uh, it was uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York who said of Kissinger that he knew Burke, he, he knew, you know, he knew the, I guess, in and out, ins and outs of Burke uh, since he was born. And I believe, um, I believe that that goes true for most uh, realists, um, especially the great ones, Cannon, Morgenthau, Kissinger, and the like. Um, so, and it, it baffles me to see that, you know, American conservatives, when they invoke Burke in regards to say domestic policy and certain like you know radical certain like reforms of um, welfare and such, they would invoke Burke in saying that well we should uh, approach it gradually rather than drastically. But then in the realm of foreign policy, so suddenly there's no Burke. It's Wilson now. It's Wilson that they are it's invoking. It's um, definitely Wilson. So um, yes. Um, I say, how can uh, how can uh, I guess uh, Burke Edmund Burke be revived in the discussions on foreign policy these days? You know, I the, I my own view of things like this are, are pretty pessimistic. Um, there there are there are very few Burke conservatives in the United States today. I mean, most in fact, there are very few conservatives really. Um, in in, um, in in the word itself has become sort of vague because it's not too sure what we're trying to conserve. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there, if you mean pe people who are seriously on on the right, um, there are very few people like that in in the United States. Uh, the the both of the parties, the Republicans and, and Democrats, are essentially uh, leftists of one sort or another. Um, they're not they're not Burkeans. I don't think most of them ever heard of Burke. Um, uh, Insofar as they sort of have any kind of uh, knowledge of much of anything, most of them are totally ignorant. Uh, it's certainly Wilson and the idea that 
democracy and human rights are, is the end state for all, all people. Even though, as Kennan pointed out, and, other, and others have too, that there's no such thing as human rights. I mean, no one knows what they are. Um, and if, in fact, they grow, the list grows uh, every by the day. You know, we've got so many human rights. Basically, what human rights are in this country is what, what anyone wants is a human right. Yes. And I think of another great uh, British uh, conservative, uh, Michael Oakeshott. And to be honest, um, I think um, neither Burke nor Oakeshott would find themselves at home with any conservative movement, so to speak, in either America or the UK. That's right. But nevertheless, I think um, I think Cannon would be uh, would you know feel at home with the doctrines of uh, I guess both Burke and Oakeshott. So yes, I think he would have. Yeah. So I guess uh, in in uh, invoking the Burkean way of reform, um, how would Cannon, you know, advocate for I guess um, certain gradual reforms in places where tyranny occurs, which you know, is still a great many nations on earth. Of course, uh, I think basically is the attitude was um, what the only thing we can do is try to set an example that other people might find attractive. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. I mean, um, that um, we hope the best for people. We hope to try to set an example of decency and um, uh, good government and hope that other people might see something attractive in that and be drawn to it. That's it. I mean, the, the idea that you, that the neocons have, we can just force it on people. If they don't like it, that's their fault. You know, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just force it on them. And um, so Kennan, you know, to him, that's totally foreign way of thinking. Okay, so uh, final question. So you named the book George Kennan for our time. So um, I guess for the for our time portion, um, what has the later generations of diplomats um, failed to learn from him, and what should they urgently learn from George Cannon? I, unfortunately, I don't think they've learned much of anything from him. Uh, they they are either neoconservatives um, or liberal interventionists, and they they really have pretty much the same idea that the world should be remade in America's interest by and by which they mean democracy and human rights um and um that's that's their attitude and they they, they believe that it's not just that they wish for this they think they have a duty to impose this on people who don't quite get the message you know um and uh, it's because it's for their own good that we're we're doing this and um uh, this is something totally foreign to Again, it's outlook. You don't you don't try to impose yourself on other people. You hope to set a decent example, and you hope that this will in, influence them in some way to to improve you know improve the government in their own country. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can certainly understand that. I think even if um, American military, I guess, sees all uh, I guess foreign adventures, so to speak, um, the influence of American culture still spreads throughout the, the world. Um, I mean, I was raised on Hollywood movies. And even if in countries that are well undemocratic, so to speak, the notion of American democracy and personal freedom still rings, I guess, true in the minds of many, many, you know, especially in the younger generation. So I think Cannon may have a point on that. So on that note, um, thank you very much, Professor Lee Congdon, the pessimistic interpreter of George Cannon. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you take care of yourself and happy Easter. Thank you, thank you.